Evet, herkese hoş geldin diyoruz. E, kolokyumumuzun e, konuğu değerli Martin Stokes. Kendisi bugün bize e, söyleyeceğim. <gülüyor> Empati, kültürel mahrem ve etnomüzikolojik etik başlıklı sunumunu e, hazırladı ve sunacak. Ben öncelikle e, Martin Stokes'tan biraz bahsetmek istiyorum. E, Martin Stokes, King Edward müzik profesörü ve Oxford Üniversitesi'nde müzik ve sosyal antropoloji eğitimi almıştır. Belfast Queen Üniversite, Üniversitesi'de e, 1989 ve 97 arası, Chicago Üniversitesi'nde 1997 ve 2007 arası ve Oxford Üniversitesi'nde 2007 ve 2012 arasında dersler veren Stokes, 2002-2003 yılları arasında yıllarında e, Chicago Beşeri Bilimler Enstitüsü'nde Harvard Vakfı Bursiyeri olarak araştırmalar yapmıştır. İki kez İstanbul, Boğa- İstanbul Boğaziçi Üniversitesi'nde misafir öğretim görevlisi olarak görev yapmış, öğretim üyesi olarak görev yapmış Profesör Stokes, halen Kopenhag Üniversitesi Sanat ve Kültür Araştırmaları bölümünde fahri profes- profesörlük görevini sürdürmektedir. Keith College, London Müzik bölümünde Bölüm Başkanı ve öğretim üyesi olarak görev yapmakta olan Martin Stokes aynı zamanda British Akademi üyesidir. Ee, bu kısa özgeçmişiyle e, değerli Martin biraz da ben öncelikle Türkçe e, sunumunun Türkçe özetini okuyacağım. Daha sonra sözü e, diğer moderatör arkadaşım Richard Germa bırak- bırakacağım. O e, İngilizce olarak devam edecek. Empati, kültürel mahrem ve etnomüzikolojik etik. Empati bugünlerde politik bir erdemdir ve önemi özellikle COVID-19 pandemisi zamanında artmıştır. Aynı zamanda müzik, empati duygusu yaratma veya bu duyguyu aşılama kapasitesine sahip olması bakımından açık bir şekilde değer görmüştür. Etnomüzikoloji de empatiye araştırılan müzikal yapıya katılımın dış görünümü ve bu yapıyla duygusal etkileşim bağlamında yahut araştırılan ve araştıran arasındaki araştıran arasındaki fikri çatışmaları çözümleme hususunun çeşitli bağlamları bakımından önem atfetmektedir. Fakat bu oldukça sorunlu bir terimdir. Bu noktada etnomüzikolojinin kökenlerini hiç de empatik olmayan bir müzikal karşılaşmadan aldığının söylenebileceğini de hatırlayabiliriz. Russo'nun 18. yüzyıldaki Rans de Vaches halk şarkısını söyleyen İsviçreli paralı askerlerle olan karşılaşması. Bu şarkı onları gözyaşına boğarken onda böyle bir etki yaratmamış ve bilindiği gibi Russo bu durumun sebebini merak etmiştir. Bu noktada şu sorular sorulabilir. Müzikte duygularda ortaklaşmayı ifade eden şefkat, duygusallık, sempati gibi terimler için alternatif düşünme biçimleri var mıdır? Başka bir deyişle bu sorunlu terim için alternatifler var mıdır? Müzik ve müzik çalışmalarında duygusal katılım ve aktivizm için alternatif temeller var mıdır? Günümüzde kültürel mahrem kavramıyla ifade edilen eleştirel yapılar bu hususlarla ilgili bazı yeni yollar sunmaktadır. Bu Türkçe özeti okuduktan sonra ben sözü e, moderatör arkadaşım Richard Cermar bırakıyorum. Richard. Uh, thank you Semih. <coughs> thank you. Uh, I just looked uh, how many participants we got and uh, I see actually there are no participants from abroad, but uh, hopefully also they will come because this is actually our first international colloquium. <clears throat> uh, this is, uh, as you can see from the posters, fourth colloquium that is organized by the uh, Istanbul University students, the musicology department, but actually first uh, international because uh, Our guest uh, tonight is uh, <clears throat> uh, actually very important uh, uh, musicologue uh, abroad. <clears throat> And uh, before I introduce our <clears throat> special guest, uh, I would like to say just in the beginning <clears throat> that uh, actually uh, usually we are thinking everybody on the end, but sometimes we are forgetting. So let me just uh, thank uh, to certain uh, people in the beginning, so we will not forget on the end. So especially to our um, Hikmet 
Ho Chi Minh's teacher, Hikmet teacher, that was actually his idea to uh, organize these uh, meetings. And uh, we, it's very uh, useful for us, for the students, uh, that we can actually try to talk uh, about musicology in a, like sign in a scientist, uh, scientific way. Also, uh, thanks to, of course, Istanbul University as a, that it's <clears throat> giving us the opportunity to uh, uh, do things like that. And um, also thanks to all the students who are participating uh, on our <clears throat> uh, project, uh, especially the ones who are uh, active. Uh, for example, uh, every time actually we are forgetting to uh, our uh, uh, classmate Berfin, that she's uh, actually uh, doing the graphical side of our uh, colloquiums, so we can actually uh, weeks before uh, to get known that uh, this is going to happen and when. And when you see the poster, um, actually behind there is a picture of Martin <clears throat> Stokes and behind you can see also there is picture of Jean-Jacques Rousseau which is very important uh, for us because as also uh, our friend Sammy just said before that this uh, colloquium of today um, has got three topics. Uh, first is empathy uh, then it's uh, culture intimacy. And the third topic is uh, ethics in musicology. Uh, all these uh, three uh, terms, the topics are very connected uh, to each other. I mean, it's not possible just now I will talk empathy, I will talk uh, musicology, ethics and so on, because all these things is like complex things. So, uh, and actually, uh, the thing about Jean-Jacques Rousseau, that uh, as also Semi said, uh, there is this famous story of him traveling um, from somewhere to somewhere. He met this Swiss uh, uh, soldier singing the song that was actually uh, forbidden because they once they are start to sing uh, sing the song or hear the song they start to cry so much they were missing their homeland and jean jacques rousseau just didn't uh, feel anything and that what actually made him think what the what is going on i mean and to investigate more about the feeling of the people what they are um, experiencing by hearing the music and that's why actually uh, nowadays we consider Jean-Jacques Rousseau maybe first uh, musicologue at all, or in a musicologue, of course, before there were other people who were uh, uh, interested in this concert, but in the way that we are thinking now, I mean, uh, what is the music to, to our psychology, to our emotions and all this kind of thing. And Martin actually, uh, <clears throat> as a very, uh, as I said before, as a very important uh, uh, musicologue abroad, also spent uh, lots of time in Turkey since uh, we just talked about it before, since 80s uh, coming to Turkey and his interest uh, was also uh, the also music in the Middle East, but especially Turkey. And uh, <clears throat> he published a very uh, beautiful book, uh, Aşk Cumhuriyeti, the Republic of Love. And there uh, also the term, actually for us new term, uh, culture intimacy, which actually hopefully we will uh, try to understand uh, today because uh, when we were translating the from English to Turkish, the, what the, actually the culture intimacy is, we uh, had a little bit difficulties because uh, um, first of all, is a language bar barrier. The, um, some words just cannot express the thing what uh, the other language can, and uh, it's actually something really connected with the you know with the every culture. So, uh, in this way, I would like to leave uh, word to our special guest Martin, and uh, hopefully we will uh, have a. 
uh, good time together and we will uh, increase our, our matter of understanding in this uh, matter. So please, Martin. Thank you, Richard. Um, thank you, Sunny, for your very kind introduction. Thank you to Hikmet Toker for his uh, kind um, invitation to me to come and speak to you this evening. I'm sorry that I can't be with you. It would be a beautiful thing to be in one room together, to be talking around a table, to be having a face-to-face -face, uh, seminar. But sadly, we are in the times that we are, and that will have to wait until this pandemic is finally over, and I hope it's over very soon. I hope that you're all well. I hope that you're all in good health. I hope that your families are all in good health, and I hope you have been surviving this very strange period of our lives. I'm going to speak in English um, because um, it's been, I was in Turkey until the pandemic started and then I had to come back here and I've essentially just been in this room <laughs> for most of the last year, as we all have um, in our different ways. So it's, it'll, it's easier for me to think uh, and speak in English, but do please feel free to ask your questions if you have any um, in Turkish and we can, I can easily understand and um, we'll be able to manage with our expert uh, translators um, around us. So I hope you will feel very free to ask any questions that you have. So what um, I want to do um, over the next 30 minutes is to give the outline of an argument um, that has taken shape in my head over recent years. And it has some connection with the argument of Ashk Jumhurieti, which Richard kindly mentioned. Um, it has some connection with the ideas about uh, cultural intimacy, this term that we have difficulty in translating. But it has some connection with some more general questions about where ethnomusicology is as a discipline these days. Ethnomusicology is increasingly thinking about um, not um, just abstracted academic study, but the terms of its activism, the terms of its engagement, the terms of its participation, the terms of its fundamental practice. And during this period, we have started thinking about some of the words, some of the terms that organize this practice. And amongst these terms, the word empathy is a word that has just been growing in more and more, uh, has been growing um, more and more significant, more and more important with each passing year. So it's a little argument about this term empathy. It's an argument about what this term empathy means in musicology and in ethnomusicology. And it's a question about some of the problems associated with this term. What I'll do is I'm going to share the screen so you'll see my slides. And in the slides, I'll spell out my argument bit by bit. Um, so hopefully it will be clear to you and you'll be able to follow the argument. So at this point, I'm going to share the screen. And hope that that is all that's required. You can, Richard, just, can you just nod or wave? You can see my screen. Yes, I Good. can see. Hopefully everybody can see. Yes, so, empathy, cultural, mahrem, ethnomusicology there. Ethic. So the, the first uh, thing to underline is that empathy has become a very important word signifying 
meaning um, political um, ethics, uh, meaning a, a particular kind of political uh, ethic. Um, politicians are com always talking um, about empathy. The popularity of politicians is routinely being uh, measured and understood in terms of empathy. I think maybe this goes back 10 years, 15 years. Um, in the United States of America, we were associated with Barack Obama, um, who notably said in an interview back in 2015, when I think about how I understand my role as a citizen, setting aside being a president, the most important set of understandings that I bring to that position of citizen, the most important stuff I've learned from novels, the most important stuff I've learned from novels. It has to do with empathy. It has to do with being comfortable with the notion that the world is full of greys and the notion that it's possible to connect with somebody else, even though they are very different to you. So the idea of empathy here, the idea of, of feeling something at the same time as somebody else is connected here with um, kind of uh, moral interrogation of the world um, and with the idea of um, connecting people across, across difference. Barack Obama was considered to be an empathetic president. To a certain extent, George Bush was considered to be an empathetic president. Uh, to a very large extent, Donald Trump was considered to be a very non-empathetic president. And his, um, his fall uh, as, a, as a president had to do with this perceived lack of empathy. So in the United States, this term empathy has become a very important way of talking about, about political competence, political value, political integrity, integrity, and one's suitability to be president of the country. In the United Kingdom, we would think, for example, of Tony Blair as having been a very empathetic prime minister. He cultivated empathy. He was clever at kind of building the idea that he was an empathetic president. We would consider, by contrast, uh, our current uh, Prime Minister, Boris Johnson, Johnson, as being very lacking um, in empathy. And this could turn out to be very costly for him. So empathy has become a very um, significant uh, political uh, ethic, a very significant political Ooh. virtue. Ethic, uh, sorry, empathy um, is also a musical uh, ethic. Um, it seems to be everywhere in musicology and ethnomusicology at the moment for thinking about what we do and the value of what we do. It is a very, it plays a very important role in what I might just call musical activism, if you want, the using of scholarship to um, pursue or to construct um, or to carry out various kinds of a project of one kind or another. The using of musical instruments to bridge uh, communal violence, for example, I think of the different drums project in uh, Northern Ireland, uh, using musical instruments as, as a means of constructing um, kind of empathetic uh, relations between Protestants and Catholics there. I think of the ways in which music has been uh, constructed to empathize with the plight of refugees and migrants. There was in recent years, the uh, Yazidi uh, chorus um, who performed in London. This was a project run by an NGO uh, called the Amar Foundation. And music was very important there as a means of raising um, people's consciousness and awareness. There, we, we can think of how music is used to focus historic uh, grievances for national uh, minority or indigenous communities, such as in um, what, what's called in Australia, Sorry Day, which is where the white settlers um, apologize 
to the indigenous people for the violence that was done to them. We can think of the use of musicians or the visits of musicians as empathetic foci in order to address sites of historic conflict. So I would think um, um, of Ono uh, Dingtian's uh, visit to Diyarbakir uh, a few years ago as a very interesting example of a kind of site specific um, uh, construction of empathy in a site of historic conflict. I think of musical performance as a means of cultivating empathy with survivors of historic violence. So, for example, in the case of Korea's comfort women who were um, essentially uh, women um, who worked in the Japanese sex industries um, during the time of Japan's colonization of Korea, um, a very uh, complex um, um, situation between Korea and Japan up to the present day. Um, and um, there have been studies of how musical performance um, has been used there as a means of, of, of cultivating a broader field of empathy around these survivors, both in Korea and, Je uh, and Japan. I would think of the use of music as a tool of empathy um, during the corona pan, uh, coronavirus pandemic, and I'm sure we can all think of examples of this, um, but a very recent example in the United Kingdom, uh, where I live and where I'm based, um, was Major Tom Moore, um, a 100-year-old former um, army officer um, who joined up with a singer called Michael Ball to make a charity recording of the, uh, the great song You'll Never Walk Alone, which many of you will know as Liverpool Football Club's um, anthem. Um, but this was all a, a about, you know, using the song um, to uh, organise national empathy with the pain and loneliness um, of the elderly. So um, wherever one looks, we can see music, um, it seems in many parts of the world being used to, um, to organise um, practices which are about the cultivating of, of empathy to deal with uh, social problems, to do with historical problems, to do with political problems. The role of music in these situations is to cultivate empathy. It seems to me to be a very widespread story. <clears throat> empathy, let's just remind us uh, that what the term empathy commonly means in English is simultaneously experienced shared feeling. Okay, so it's not just the sharing of the feeling, two different people feeling joy at the same time or feeling sorrow at the same time, but the simultaneity of that feeling, which raises some very complex questions about how feelings get from one person to another, how they are, as it were, transmitted. In music, what we're looking at is the idea of empathy as the cultivation of simultaneous shared feelings through music or through the use of music or musicians or musical in, uh, instruments to reveal histories of shared feeling. So that serves as a kind of common sense definition of how we're using this word empathy in the way in, in studying um, kind of musical activism um, and the values that we are attaching to it, which is, I've wanted to say very early on, our political values. Here's some pictures just to enliven the screen. That's um, uh, Captain Tom um, on the top left, a, a hundred year old man who released this charity single with uh, Michael Ball. On the top right, there's a picture of uh, Sorry Day in Australia. And at the bottom there, there is London's Yazidi uh, Chorus, which gave um, concerts um, organized, or at least significantly organized to a significant degree by the Amar Foundation um, in London. These are refugees from Northern Iraq, of course. Ariana Phillips Hutton, has said this, surveying the field of music in 
conflict resolution, a field in which ethnomusicologists have played a very significant role, she observes, and I quote here, an often implicit, and sorry, an often implicit reliance on an ethically inflected discourse of empathy, an often implicit reliance on an ethically inflected discourse of empathy. So she's noting in this very good book, which I recommend here, called Music Resolving Conflict, published by Cambridge University Press um, last year. Um, she's noting um, and underlining um, what I've started off with in, in this talk, which is the, the kind of imp either implicit but often explicit uh, discourse of empathy. Um, underpinning musical activism of one kind or another. The term empathy is, uh, the term empathy plays a role in ethnomusicology at the moment. I could refer you to a very good uh, discussion which took place, which was published in 2019, involving Anne Rasmussen, Angela Impey, Rachel Beckles Wilson, Ozan Aksoy, Denise Gill, and Michael Frischkoff, concerning ethnomusicological responses to the contemporary dynamics of migrants and refugees. Um, it's a very rich discussion, a very complex discussion, um, but one of the things that is important in this discussion is the way in which almost all of the contributors to this discussion uh, stress the need for um, empathy for the tremendous uh, difficulties in Western Europe and North America faced by migrants and refugees um, who we've seen um, drowning in the Mediterranean and the, um, and the Aegean. Um, and we've seen encountering terrible difficulties as they've made their way um, across Central America um, in recent years. So there's a call on the one hand for empathy, for co-feeling, for um, feeling and registering and acknowledging the pain and suffering of migrants and refugees. And for them, what's important is that the pressure that this puts, the difficulty that this creates for ethnomusicologists, people like me, who tend to consider the main part of their work, the main part of their responsibility, studying, understanding, getting things right, writing books, writing articles, publishing, and then that's the end of the story. Okay, so there's a growing argument in, in ethnomusicology that a more empathetic disposition towards the suffering of other people needs to trouble it needs to complicate our conven the conventions of academic and scholarly life okay that empathy is something that should trouble the habitual ways in which we um, in which we write in which we think and in which we talk including in environments like this so the arguments uh, for um, as it were an empathetic ethnomusicology is one that grows in various ways and i think that that's an instance of it and of course i say this not to um, to critique um, these these authors but it's just to note something important about what they're saying i'd also notice um, note um, a the rise of a psychology of music which is very explicitly concerned with the question of empathy a good volume that came out sorry i didn't put the date there but i think it's 2018 was elaine king and caroline waddington's edited volume called music and empathy published by routledge i think it's 2018 um so uh, the, the psychology uh, of music has turned to the question of empathy um, with a lot of vigor and a lot of energy. But what are the problems with this term empathy? Okay, so the term empathy is all around us. It's a term that has just become a kind of common sense um, marker of how we value music, of how we value politics, and of what we value, of what we are increasingly looking for in 
musicology and in ethnomusicology and in the study of music these days. Are we happy with this term empathy? Is, is this term empathy, is this idea of simultaneous co-feeling, is, is this a good idea or is it a problematic idea? Now, we have to start off, I think, by acknowledging that the term empathy has a lot of problems associated with it. In the first instance, the English language usage of the term derives from a mistranslation of a German term, Einfühlung, a term which was coined in 1903 or perhaps earlier and translated into English as empathy by Edward Titchener in 1909. So two things to note here. One, this is a very modern term. And the other is that there are some translational problems here. Okay, Einfühlen does not exactly mean empathy. We'll come on to this a, a, little, uh, a little later. So it's both a modern term, it's a very recent term, and it's a term that has got certain translational uh, problems associated with it. I would note too that the, the term was intended to replace the literary vagueness of terms like sympathy and compassion with something considered to be both psychologically and philosophically rigorous. Okay, so that's the third point to make here about empathy was the, it's supposedly it's a scientific term here. It's a rigorous psychological and philosophical term. Whereas these ideas like sympathy and compassion um, are somehow just literary ideas, kind of poetic ideas as it were that have no place in academic study. But, the first thing we realize when we stop and think about this is that the term empathy is neither rigorous nor scientific, okay? Um, first of all, when we are applying the term to uh, music, we need to ask whether we're talking about something called musical empathy or whether we are talking about cultivating empathy through music. There's an important distinction to be made between these two things. And when psychologists are talking about empathy in music, it's never clear whether they're talking about musical empathy or whether they're talking about cultivating empathy through music. Two very different things, I would suggest. Secondly, is empathy in music a cause or is it an effect? Is empathy what happens through music or is empathy something that is actually required to start off with in order to produce good music? Right? So is empathy in music a cause or an effect? Seems to me that nobody is very clear about this. Thirdly, is empathy always, ethically speaking, a good thing? I think anybody who is capable of thinking about ethics will understand that feeling the same thing as somebody else at the same time is not always necessarily a good thing. We might have reasons to want to keep our feelings private, for example. We might have reasons to believe that when somebody says that they're feeling the same thing at the same time as us, we might want to say, no, actually, you're not feeling the same thing at the same time as me. You're having a different feeling. So from a moral and an ethical point of view, empathy is not always, simply speaking, a good thing. I would note that scientific methodologies usually fail to, to pin it down. They, they, they, it's a, empathy is a very elusive idea. And the psychology of music or um, cognitive psychology has a lot of difficulty actually saying, describing a given moment or a given transaction in terms of empathy. It's very difficult to, to, to pin down. I would note also that musical feelings are rarely pure, but they're always mediated by words. So um, the scientific theories of empathy seem to uh, allow very little space for discussion about um, when we're talking, when we're having musical feelings or when we're having feelings through music, that a very important part of that experience is to use words to describe these feelings. So we're always translating. We're always dealing with language, okay? We're not just dealing as it were with pure feeling. We're dealing with language and translation and communication. The, the uh, Psychological studies of musical empathy 
are always limited to Western classical music. They are always limited to Western art music and occasionally jazz. So they're, they're talking about music, but they're always talking about a very narrow experience of the world's music. They're always based on the assumption of individuated social actors. They're always based on the idea of feeling flowing between two bounded um, human beings, okay? So the idea of feeling somehow being contagious or that feeling of somehow being collective is really not part of the way in which the psychologists studying empathy understand empathy. But you and I, in our understanding of empathy, all have a very um, implicit and a very well-grounded sense of emotions as not necessarily being individual things. We can feel things collectively uh, after all. Coming to the end here, it, it, this term empathy, again, it, it, it assumes that participation, that, that kind of feeling something together and singing something together and playing something together and that participating, uh, musically speaking, is always uh, a good thing. And once again, one can think of all sorts of reasons where this value of participation may not be um, it's quite the important thing or quite the overriding thing that certainly many ethnomusicologists and psychologists often tend to think. I direct you here to Matt Rahane's um, article in 2017, uh, and I can give you a bibliographic reference to this. So I'm sorry this is a slightly heavy slide, this one, but what I want to communicate in this slide is that the term empathy is really quite a problematic word. It's difficult to know what situations it refers to, it's difficult to know how to use this term empathy actually in relation to music or to any problems that we might want to address in and through music. Now here is what interests me in just coming to uh, the crunch here, which is that this thing that we call ethnomusicology or the comparative study of music has at its very uh, heart um, a scene uh, which um, Richard uh, uh, has already um, alluded to, which is a foundational scene in the comparative study of music, which is all about an empathy breakdown. It's all about empathy not happening. It's all about a failure of empathy. So this I find interesting. Jean-Jacques Rousseau, who lived between 1712 and 1778, uh, one of the great uh, philosophers of the Enlightenment with interests in language and in music and political community and in democracy, um, wrote some very important um, studies about music and, mu and song and music in relation uh, to language. And um, both in his essay on the origin of language and in his dictionary of music, we encountered the story of the singing of Rons des Vaches by the Swiss mercenaries. As you will already know um, from Richard's uh, introduction to this, uh, Rousseau encountered these mercenaries singing this song, becoming melancholic longing for their home country in Switzerland, crying and weeping. Rousseau himself listened, but he couldn't have that sensation. He didn't share those emotions. He listened, but he couldn't, he didn't find himself crying himself. He didn't find himself weeping or becoming melancholic himself. He was struck by the, uh, the strength of their emotions. He said that the song he was struck by how powerfully the song evoked those emotions. He said the song Rons des Vaches was so generally beloved amongst the mercenaries that it was forbidden to be played in their troops under pain of death because it made them burst into tears, desert or die, whoever hear it. So great a desire did excite in them of returning to their country. It, it had such a powerful effect on them that the mercenaries had to be forbidden to sing it is what we are told here. Now, why this was interesting to Rousseau was because until the time of Rousseau, people believed that when we listened to music, we, we shared the same feelings because we were all 
vibrating in the same way. Our bodies vibrated, our musical instruments vibrated, sound waves vibrated in the air. We shared those vibrations, and because we shared the vibrations, we therefore shared the same feelings. Okay, so the same music, according to Platonic, according to medieval music theory, the same music would always produce the same emotions. It would always produce the same feelings because we all shared the same vibrational space. Let's think of this as medieval. Let's think of this as Platonic. Let's think of this as Pythagorean. Think of it as you will. We might call these vibrational theories of shared musical uh, emotion. At the time of the Enlightenment, these theories were breaking down. People were looking at music and looking at song and encountering something different. And Rousseau's encounter with the Swiss mercenaries was a crucial moment in which people realized that people might sing the same thing or they might play the same musical instrument or they might play the same, uh, they, uh, they might play the same song. But people hear things differently. People hear differently because they belong to different cultures. People hear differently because they have different cultural mechanisms, we might want to say now, that mean that when they hear something, they hear something that means something in a particular way and that causes certain emotional reactions, that causes certain emotional uh, states to arise. So Rousseau described these as this as uh, these as memorative signs, as a scene memoratif, and he's interested in, as he put it, the mechanisms that linked sound and sentiment. He says what we have to understand if we if our task is to understand why some people hear a song and they cry, somebody else hears a song and they don't cry. We need to understand what these mechanisms are that make one person cry and the other person not cry. So this is the beginning of a theory of cultural difference in music and in song that Rousseau um, was amongst others was discovering at the time. This is Rousseau's transcription of the Swiss folk song, Rons des Vaches. A very poor rendition there, but it's quite interesting, isn't it? Rousseau was very good at transcribing music. He transcribed this song with quite a lot of uh, detail and accuracy, the, the different speeds. He's written that it's being played by the bagpipe here. But you can hear it's a kind of alp horn yodeling kind of Swiss uh, melody there. So that's his transcription from the Dictionnaire de la Musique. Later in the Essay sur l'origine des langues of 1781, Rousseau was to make the following observation. I'll just read the English here. To the extent that we only consider sounds in terms of the shaking or the vibrations or les branlements, that were there, les branlements, um, that they excite in our nerves, we will never understand the true principles of music and its power over our hearts. So this is Rousseau in the Dictionnaire uh, de Musique and the Essay sur l'origine des langues. And um, so what's important here is um, a discovery of cultural difference, um, the, the end of vibrational theories about musical shared feeling, and the construction of, of a problem. He sees a problem here in how it is that we, can, we come to share emotions in music, because we're all different. Okay, and if we're not just sharing the same vibrational space, we need to have some other way of explaining how another person's musical emotions are things that we can perceive and experience ourselves. So in some ways, 
we can say that this is the beginning of a, a process of scientific inquiry into musical meaning and into musical emotion. And in some ways we can say that this is the beginning of a very modern kind of inquiry into musical um, uh, understanding, musical signification, if you will. And because um, of the newness of this, um, some people, some distinguished French ethnomusicologists like Gilbert Rouget have said, actually the first ethnomusicologist, the person to really invent a comparative musicology or an ethnomusicology is uh, Jean-Jacques Rousseau. And he's somebody we should be thinking of as the first ethnomusicologist. So I think that this is um, it's quite interesting. We value empathy in music, we value empathy in politics, we value empathy in musical activism, and we value ethnomusicology, but let's say the first ethnomusicologist was somebody who had, who started off with, a, a, with um, describing an encounter um, in which musical um, empathy was notably lacking. So the question we need to ask ourselves, are there better words then? What have we returned this question about empathy to the European philosophical environment of the 18th century, to the so-called cult of sentiment, a period of intellectual history and cultural history in which this I the idea of shared feeling was so important, so very important. So before we started using this pseudo-scientific word empathy, what words were people using? Well, Rousseau's favorite word was pity, la pitié. Okay, um, in the context of the French Revolution, this idea of pity as the kind of master passion was extremely important. Compassion, okay, the, the kind of Latin version of the kind of, so if empathy is Greek, compassion is exactly the same thing, but in Latin, but compassion is the 18th century term. It's not the late 19th or 20th century term. Sympathy is another crucial term here, a rather English term here, translated in French in pretty much the same way in German as um, Empfindsamkeit, of course. And sentiment and sentimentality uh, are two other um, terms and frameworks that we need to bear in mind here. So this is one thing we can do. If we're unhappy with this term empathy, we can go back to an earlier period in history and ask ourselves, are there better words? Are there more interesting words? Why do this though? Well, I would suggest that one reason to do this is to return the question of empathy or of co-feeling to philosophy, to literature and culture, and I might say also to politics and away from quote unquote science and particularly away from psychology. I do not feel that psychology has really got a grasp on this subject at all. So this might be a useful, uh, re this might be a good reason um, to uh, return to these terms. Secondly, we might want to increase the critical, the critical sophistication with which we consider this question of co-feeling in music. We think that co-feeling, feeling things together is important, but the idea of just sharing things at the same time in some kind of unmediated simultaneity is clearly problematic. We need to have more sophisticated ways of understanding this. Um, thirdly, if we might achieve something by uh, understanding the 18th century debates about co-feeling. Now this I think is the important thing here because in the 18th century, very few people thought that feeling things at the same time was really possible. This is the interesting thing, thing here. The, the idea, whether we're talking about David Hume or Adam Smith or of Jean-Jacques Rousseau, the idea that we actually might feel things at the same, at the same time was considered quite a problem. You know, most philosophers actually felt that co-feeling was, you know, was difficult, as it were if not actually impossible. So if we were to understand the 18th century debates about co-feeling, we might end up with, I think, a more sophisticated idea of feeling and emotion as a moral challenge and as an imaginative exercise 
rather than simply as a psychological reality. Okay, I'm hoping this is making some sense here. And finally, it might help us to engage with some contemporary critical discourse concerning cultural intimacy. So before we go further, what is cultural intimacy then? Well, rather than trying to give you a definition, um, I would refer you to the work of Lauren Berlant, Sara Ahmed, James Chandler, Elizabeth Povinelli, Martha Nussbaum, and Christopher Plummer, and uh, Eva Illouz in the fields of um, literary theory, film theory, anthropology, philosophy, political theory, and sociology, respectively. A monograph of my own, Ashtrum Hurrieti, uh, The Republic of Love, draws very directly on this line of thought. Um, there is a bibliography there. I'll just keep it on the screen for a few moments if people want to um, just do a screen save or um, take a picture of that, or I can go back to this uh, later. But these are, I think, the key texts um, concerning what we might call uh, um, cultural intimacy. Um, uh, but I will attempt just a very simple definition of cultural intimacy, with, which is that it's the study of ideologies of uh, closeness um, and of shared feelings. Now, in the literature on cultural intimacy, the term sentimentalism um, is a rather important one. Um, it's a problematic term. It's associated, the word sentimentality is associated with, as it were, bad culture, with culture that is excessively emotional, that is lowbrow, poor quality, uh, popular culture, lumpen in some shape or form. So in the 20th century, the term sentimentalism or, or sentiment had come to acquire negative meanings. meanings. But in the 18th century, sentimentalism had a much more positive frame of reference. Lauren Berlant describes this as sentimentalism's unfinished business. It had, uh, it posed radical challenges imagining equality on the basis of shared feeling in the 18th century, in 18th century philosophical and political theory, which she feels still have to be are still yet to be realized. Sentimentalism can be looked at, I think, uh, interestingly with reference to um, two philosophers who are very important in our part of the world, perhaps much more so than Jean-Jacques Rousseau, and that is David Hume and Adam Smith. And these are the, the key texts that I want to reflect on very short, uh, very briefly. For a minute here, David Hume's Treatise of Human Nature, Adam Smith's Theory of Moral Sentiments, and Adam Smith's uh, Inquiry into the Nature and Causes of the Wealth of Nations. Adam Smith was a very important figure in the so-called Scottish Enlightenment, and here is a picture of beautiful Glasgow University, which I visited a couple of years ago to conduct a PhD viva. And on the right in the main, one of the main halls there is a statue of Adam Smith. Even though he lived, he was from Edinburgh and he lived in Edinburgh in Glasgow, they still, the rival city, they still um, have a, um, a uh, picture of him. Smithian sentimental theory arose in argument with his friend David Hume. Concerning moral experience, Hume argued that as in strings equally wound up, the motion of one communicates itself to the rest. So Hume's idea was that feeling was vibrational. Hume was very attached to the vibrational idea of theory. We are all like instruments. We are all like musical instruments. Our strings are all equally wound up. If you pluck one string in terms of feelings, in terms of feeling joyful, in terms of feeling sad, in terms of feeling anything else, that motion communicates itself sympathetically by, by, by vibrations uh, to the rest. So Hume's moral theory was based on this vibrational idea of shared feeling. Now Smith disagreed with this. 
And I'm coming to the end of my talk here, and I'm aw I'm aware that these are complex uh, uh, and, and ideas here, but let me just try and summarize why Smith saw things differently. Smith was not very interested in whether or not we actually shared feelings. What Smith was interested in was the fact that we spend a lot of time imagining how we might, we spend a lot of time imagining how other people feel. So for Smith, when he was talking about feeling and when he was talking about its relation to morality, firstly, the emphasis was on the morality of the marketplace, the assembly of strangers. Okay, so he's an imagining a situation in which in emerging commercial society um, in 17th century um, Britain, that we're all strangers. Okay, he's, there's no community as there was for Rousseau. Everybody is a stranger. The emphasis there is thereby on mediation, on imagination, on communication and rhetoric. Okay, so people don't, it's not simply that people feel the, shit, the same things, but through mediation, through acts of imagination, through acts of communication and through acts of rhetoric, people are constantly talking about their feelings. They're trying to persuade other people about their feelings. Okay, so this is important. Thirdly, he insisted on the presence of the impartial spectator in spaces of co-feeling. Feeling always needed to be deliberated by a third party. It's not enough if I feel something and Richard feels something and we both share that feeling. It requires an impartial spectator, Hikmet Hoxha, for example, to be looking in from the outside to be able to help us understand what these feelings are. So there's a third party always involved. Co-feeling for Smith didn't allow judgment, okay, it prohibited judgment. Fourthly, moral judgment may be reference to feelings, but without expectation, of, without the expectation that feelings should necessarily be shared. Okay, so Smith's point was we can think about feelings, but we don't necessarily have to believe in the, uh, always believe that feelings are shared or that they should be fared. Uh, that th they should be shared. Smithian sentimental theory is unpopular now in the late 19th, in the late uh, 20th century and in the early 21st century, his ideas are quite unpopular. He's critical of the idea of co-feeling and empathy is something, as I said at the very beginning, that we take very seriously. So he's critical of the idea of empathy from the outset. He's stoic, patrician, distanced, has a somewhat aristocratic kind of view of emotions. Okay, this is not fashionable at all. Secondly, he grappled with the realities of life in capitalism rather than simply hoping that capitalism would disappear. So in the 20th century, we've all got used to the idea that capitalism is a very bad thing. Now, Adam Smith actually thought that capitalism was fine. It was just OK, and it might actually lead us in positive direction. So this also makes him a very unfashionable thinker. Thirdly, he's very little read by ethnomusicologists or, or people interested in culture because he didn't actually have to say very much about music or art. David Hume, his friend, by contrast, had a very great deal to say about art and music. So for mu musicologists tend to read Hume and not read um, Adam Smith. To conclude, I think that there are three conclusions that the musicologists might draw from Smithian sentimental theory. One is that, that it might enhance our ability to think about public musical activism beyond empathy, beyond the idea that we must all feel the same thing here, beyond the idea of emotional participation. And I would want to suggest that this is important. Secondly, Smithian sentimental theory affirms the importance of narrative and rhetoric as important facets of ethnomusicological activism, grasping and assuming responsibility for the story. In other words, it affirms something that I think we sometimes forget about scholarship, which is that as well as being activists, as well as being participants, we're also writers. We're also the 
uh, shapers of of arguments um, that we're also um, um, engaged in the rational communication um, of ideas through narrative and that is something that in an age in which uh, participation is constantly stressed um, it seems to be worth saying to me thirdly smithian theory i feel validates reflexivity and experimentalism Smith was always talking about how in our discourse about emotion and feeling and its relation to uh, moral thinking um, that we have a capacity to improvise because we're always amongst strangers. We're always having to make things up. So I would say that a turn to Smithian theory validates reflexivity and experimentalism. It validates the capacity to improvise in our musical activism, to respond to the unexpected. Uh, to seek alliances with other experiment experimenters and share ideas with them. I finished um, a rather heavy uh, talk there and I appreciate that there are some dense ideas. I think that they are new um, ideas. I think that there are unfamiliar ideas. And I think that they're quite critical ideas too about how ethnomusicologists go about thinking, about activism, about participation, and the challenges that face uh, ethnomusicological scholars um, today. When I was first asked to give this talk, I was asked to give a talk about, about musicology um, and um, broader public intellectual questions. And so I feel that this question of empathy, it's complicated and troubled history in ethnomusicology and the need that we perhaps have to go uh, beyond it um, will, uh, has met that uh, that request. Um, so I hope that it's provided you with something interesting to think about. Thank you very much. Uh, Martin, thank you. Thank you very much for this, uh, for this speech. Um, actually, you gave us a base for uh, so many questions. If it would be on me, I would just, I already, uh, prepared 1,001 question for you, but of course uh, we don't have so many times. So hopefully, if you come to Turkey, we can speak about this uh, more in details because this uh, conversation every time one topic opens another topic that opens another topic. You know, because in this uh, in this uh, when it comes especially to feelings, you know, uh, so. Uh, it is just endless, uh, it can be endless conversation. So, uh, but of course, uh, I will not start asking because we have now, I have, I can see 38 participants. Also, thanks to all the participants. And I'm just uh, giving space for the question, uh, for the questions. Maybe I can start with our teacher, uh, Hikmet Tökel, if oh. he can. You can take also the word and uh, say something, please. <clears throat> thank you, Richard. Uh, thank you, Martin. Firstly, I want to thank you for accepting our invitation and your spectacular presentation on behalf of all members of the Istanbul University Musicology Department. <clears throat> Actually, I have many questions, uh, but uh, I will ask just two questions uh, for giving up time, uh, my colleagues and my students and the other colleagues and the other students uh, from all over the musicology departments of Turkey. Uh, my first question is about uh, empathy and ethnomusicology. When I read the example you gave from Brussels, uh, it reminded me of some of the things that emerged in my mind many times when I encountered with European ethnomusicologists in Turkish music area, studying Turkish musicology area, music area. But at this point, I have to highlight that uh, I see you as an ex uh, exception, as my friend. But I admit that many times I thought about the foreign researchers on Turkish music area. They really don't like our music and cannot feel our music and just see our music and as a musician, uh, us, uh, as a subject of their study. Uh, it mm. is kind of irritative things. Uh, my question is, should the ethnomusicologist try to find new empathetic way for changing my idea as musicologists, Turkish musicologists and uh, musicians 
uh, on study Turkish music area as a historical musicologist. My first question is mm. this. Can you answer? That's a very, that's a, that's a great question. Um, that's a, that's a great question. Um, ob obviously, I don't want to suggest that that we should conduct our studies devoid of empathy. Obviously, I don't want to suggest that empathy uh, that that um, that the that, that co feeling is a bad thing. Um, um, I, I, w I would put it this way that. Um, so I'm an ethnomusicologist who has spent 30 years, more than 30 years studying Turkish music. If I didn't have an emotional connection to that music, yeah. if, if, if, if I didn't have that emotional connection, why would I have spent 30 years doing it? I wouldn't have, you know, and maybe I would have written my PhD, finished my PhD, written one book and then gone off and studied something else. Yeah, as I said, you are an exception. So, so, <laughs> um, so, um, So there's always an emotional um, motivation, I think, for research. And I think that this is a good thing. I think we need to feel something in what we are studying. Uh, we, need to be, to, we need to be pushed by emotions. Um, you know, they can be emotions of affection and they can be uh, motivation, uh, emotions of joy and they can be, they can also be emotions of irritation, they can be emotions of frustration, they can be quite negative emotions too, you know, emotion is all, you know, what I'm saying is that emotion is always a play here, but I think it's a mistake to think that, that what we're looking for is always identical emotions, you know, I think it's a mistake to think that we're, that, that, that all that matters is 100% is shared emotions, okay? Because the way in which I will emotionally respond to Turkish music will necessarily, I think, be different to the way in which you respond emotionally to Turkish music or Richard, uh, or you know, maybe some other of your listeners uh, experience Turkish music. We're all feeling something, we're all having emotions. Are they identical emotions? Probably not. However, what we do is on the basis of that emotional investment, on the basis of that emotional en engagement, we have something to talk about together. We have things that kind of bring us together because Turkish music is something that we, that we, you know, we, we love, we have an emotional investment in. So we can acknowledge, okay, because this is a really important question and I'm glad that it's the first question that, that's come up. Emotions are important regarding music. We, can ha we have an emotional connection to what we study as ethnomusicologists. Do these emotions always need to be the same emotions and identical emotions? No. Is there potentially a problem with thinking of these emotions as being identical? I think there is a problem there because if we don't allow for different emotions, I think that we have all sorts of, we, we run into some terrible problems. I think the problem we have in ethnomusicology is we're driven by this idea of participation to think that we're all necessarily experiencing the same thing. And I'm, just to go right back to the beginning of my talk, I think this leads us in some problematic directions. Okay. Thank you for your question, because that just gets straight to the heart of the matter. That's, I think. that's now my second, second question is about the cultural intimacy. When I read your uh, study and your book, uh, The Law Republic, I saw one term and you quoted from the Harsfeld, sorry for my pronunciation. Assur no, no, yes, mm. assurance of shared uh, sociality. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, as I can understood, mm. uh, there's kind of in, uh, implicit contract between the uh, society and the people. Yeah. And yeah. cultural intimacy kind of component of uh, this contract. Yes. Uh, I have to ask about what is the role of music in this uh, implicit contract between the person and the uh, society. And yeah, Michael Hertzfeld's work, actually, I'll just, just type his name down here. Michael Hertzfeld. Um, he, I, actually, I should have included him on, on my slide. He's, he's quite important here because... He was one of the first
first anthropologists to use this idea of intimacy. And by the way, uh, he's very interested in music, actually. He's, he, he hasn't written about music, but he, I, I know he's very interested in music. And he did his research mainly in Greece um, um, and some other Balkan um, locales as well, but mainly in Greece. So for, so for Hertzfeld, um, music, um, he, he would see it, uh, he would see the situation as music's ability, symbolic ability to create the fantasy of yeah. shared healing in a nation, within a nation state. Yeah, we're, all, we're all healing the, the, the sound of, you know, this, this song, this musical instrument. And it's the fantasy that, that, that through this, that, that, that we all become one, okay? That, that, we, that we all have this, the, the, the, the, this feeling of sharedness. Now, what Hertzfeld notes um, with music and with many other things um, is that our feelings of participation can often be very difficult to contain within the nation state okay it's the very di feelings even when you're imagining feelings in these ways the feelings it's very difficult to contain feelings within the boundaries of the nation state so you know he's very interested in the fact that you know for many people in greece the most important ways of communicating shared feelings is actually not through greek culture but through what we might call ottoman culture or turkish culture you know, it's through, you know, baklava or <laughs> uh, Turkish cuisine or Ottoman cuisine, and and uh, and and the Turkish element in or the Ottoman element in Greek music, the Amanes and and things like that. So for so for Hertzfeld, culture is is um, unstable ground for thinking through intimacy because it promises one thing. And it delivers something else. So Michael Hertzfeld is, is quite an important person to be thinking about here. Yeah. yeah. Thank you for your yeah, question. Thank you. Thank you. There's one Turkish question. Can, can you understand it? Sorry, I'll have it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The, the, the, yes, so this is the uh, yes, good question. Thank you, Gonja. Um, as always, I would like for... to ask, uh, maybe Semi, can you read the question because uh, it will be recorded? So, uh, in order to understand uh, the question, the answer. of course, I read uh, in Turkish. Okay. Uh, merhabalar, İstanbul Üniversitesi Devlet Konservatuvarı Müzikoloji Bölümü önderliğinde Martin Stokes hocamıza detaylı sunumu için çok teşekkür ederiz. Sayın Hocam, empati, sempati terimlerini etnomüzikoloji alanı özelinde emik, yani görece heterojen ve etik, görece homojen yaklaşımlar çerçevesinde de değerlendirebilmemiz mümkün müdür? Saygılarımla demiş Gonca yeah. Demir. It is, it is. Um, I mean, yeah, uh, a, a good question. And it underlines something that um, interests me about this, this whole uh, question, um, which is... Um, the translatability um, of these terms. These are all transla translational terms. Okay, so empathy is a Greek term. Compassion is a kind of Latin translation um, of this term. You could say that the word, the expression cultural intimacy is a kind of rather ugly uh, modern English translation um, of these terms as well. So we're in complicated translational space uh, here. Gonja uh, raises the question of emic and etic terminology. Um, and I think that this is a very good question. This is, a, it's, it's an important question because um, the term empathy for a hundred years was a, a scientific term, okay? People in their everyday life didn't speak about empathy. Empathy was just a purely a strange academic term. Um, people would use a language, at least in, in Britain, uh, wh where I live, people wouldn't talk about empathy, but if people were to talk about feelings, they would talk about feelings. Um, and they would use various other 
um, kinds of language, various other kinds of terminology um, to talk um, about feelings, but they wouldn't use this term empathy. So you could say that feeling is um, an emic term and empathy is an etic term um, here. Now, what's interesting is that empathy has now become an emic term. Empathy has become the term that everybody is using um, to talk about um, all kinds of emotional transactions here. So uh, in, in, to answer your question, I think um, I would say three things. One is that when we're talking about emotions and when we're talking about emotional emotion cross-culturally, I think we have to be very conscious um, about what gets lost in translation and what gets gained in translation as well. We don't just lose things in translation. Sometimes we, we think sometimes things get better in, <laughs> in translation. Um, so when we were sitting down to construct this talk, uh, our first thought was, how are we going to translate um, cultural in uh, intimacy um, into Turkish? And this was a very interesting conversation. So translating out of these kind of Greek and European terms, translating them across the world is, is, a, is a very, very complicated thing. Secondly, I think it's right to raise the question of emic usage, everyday usage, popular usage on the one hand and the kind of scientific terms that we that we're using to refer to phenomenon uh, on the other hand and thirdly i now can't remember my third point here it'll come back to me but yes i think th those would be the two things um that i would say one translation and translatability um secondly um figuring out how we might want to make distinctions um, between a term that we're analyzing and the term that we are using ourselves to analyze that term. Okay, I mean, that, that's, that, that's a way of talking about emic and etic here. What we do in anthropology and what we do in ethnomusicology is sometimes we bring those two things quite close together. We bring the emic and the etic quite close together, right? I mean, you know, I mean, this is how we generate important and significant insights, okay? Because we're not just using big concepts, big philosophical concepts, uh, concepts um, in order to analyze, as it were, what people are doing on the ground. We want to understand the language that people themselves are using in everyday situations on the ground, in their music making or anything else. We want to understand what the what the, um, what the meaning of those terms are, what the value of those terms are, what we can understand um, in their usage of these terms. So, so what we do in anthropology and in ethnomusicology is bring emic and etic often very close together. Okay, In fact, we allow them to kind of entangle a little bit. But I think... It remains important, I think, to, have to, to, to, to see what we are doing when we do this and to be aware of exactly those distinctions. Yeah, that would be the way I would try and answer that, that question. Yeah, thank you, Conjure. Thank you, Martin. Um, are there any other questions? Maybe I can ask one or two questions. Of course, I can ask one after seeing. Actually, I was uh, looking just picture of our special teacher Ura Shoja. Yes, he of course. He wanted to ask something actually. So uh, maybe a small question. Maybe uh, the problem I think empathy, feelings, and core feelings. Uh, these terms are not scientifically measurable. <laughs> In our daily life, we can measure temperature, we can measure pressure, we can measure charge, even I can do that in my house. Uh, in scientific field, something to be measured, to be able to be uh, theorized, it, it, it should be become a theory. The problem is, of course, we can talk about uh, old things, but we are never sure. So it's very vague and uncertain. 
uh, no matter how long you uh, express your feelings or your ideas or you write the things, the problem is it is an, a kind of dead end. So I, I don't see any solution for that because I can't be sure when you listen, when we listen to, to same piece, are we going to feel the same feeling? I mean, it is not measurable. But maybe, maybe in the near future, uh, in neuropsychology, there are very brand, uh, groundbreaking developments and they're measuring many things. Of course, I'm not a neuro neuropsychologist. And I'm, as a, as a musician, I'm following many things on, on internet and, and on a daily basis. And uh, I think, I believe, uh, measuring certain things are coming maybe in 20 or 30 years so we can say uh, when you listen to this piece your brain's reaction in that something like that, in that graph and when you uh, listen to that it will be become something like that i think mm -hmm. we very we we depend on that field sure. so so i, I think in near future, uh, in musicology field, should get involved with more neuropsychology to be able to explain uh, some uncertain uh, terms. This is my idea. Uh, thank you. I, I agree strongly with with with where you started, and I disagree with where you ended. <laughs> So, but, so here is why. I, I've, you're absolutely right that empathy um, is unmeasurable. We, uh, the, the term empathy is suggests something scientific. In fact, it's not a scientific concept uh, at all. 100% I agree with that. Um, here is why I'm less confident that neuropsychology is going to provide the answers. Um, because I don't think that neuropsychology works with a sophisticated um, enough understanding of the philosophy of emotions. Um, and a sophisticated philosophy of emotions understands the relationship, I think, between feelings and language and linguistic expression. Um, it's quite hard to imagine um, a feeling that isn't connected with a word and it's very hard to imagine a word that isn't immediately um, conditioned by its place in syntax and its place in culture, its place in translation. Okay, so the moment that you acknowledge the relationship between emotions and words, I think you're moving away from the fields. You're moving away from the, the kind of spaces that neuropsychology at least as it exists at the moment, is capable of engaging with. Okay, you're moving into kind of slippery translational spaces and away from, as it were, things just going on inside your head. So that's why I disagree. Obviously, you, you might have your disagreements with the way that I'm, I'm presenting that. But I would say the answer is, is, at least the answer that I've presented in this talk has been less neuropsychology is going to provide us with the answer. And it's more that actually an 18th century imagining of the question of empathy is actually a much more sophisticated way of understanding things than our 19th and 20th century understands it. Because for Adam Smith, Adam Smith didn't believe that, he, he was pretty unconvinced that we are capable of sharing feelings. And, and even if we can share feelings, his view was, so what? Actually, that's not the most important thing that's going on here. His view was, what's significant is the efforts that we put into imagining other people's emotional conditions. Now, the anthropologist in me says, actually, the kinds of things that we do to imagine other people's feelings are actually quite empirically, they're, they're empirically observable things. You know, they're things that, we're, that, that we do. They're things that we say. They're, they are ritual situations that we construct in order to imagine the sharing of feelings, that these things can be observed. 
So I have a slightly different conception of this word science and scientific inquiry uh, to you. Mine, I think, is more anthropological. Your is, yours is more psychological. OK, we can differ on that. That's absolutely fine. Um, but I think, but it's interesting, I think, um, just responding to your interesting question here, that um, I think we're both starting from the same place here, which is that, that, that co-feeling, uh, that the simultaneity um, of feeling in music or through music is, is not necessarily the best place uh, to start and um, where the most interesting questions might be asked. Thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you. I think you, I, again, I think that, that that's raised, uh, I think, an important question. I, I, I think we differ about, about this, which is fine. But um, I think that that question, I think, again, I think it raises, it gets to the heart of the difference between the way in which ethnomusicologists tend to see this question and the music psychologists tend to see this question. The thing is, actually, in, in, in the science, now I'm following lots of artificial in, intelligence. Mm. And in every day, the... the the leap is so unimaginable, mm -hmm. so large. And I'm sometimes our artificial intelligent programs are mm -hmm. creating some text and it is almost in, uh, you cannot understand, you cannot distinguish if it, if it is a, a program or it's created by a human being. Mm -hmm. Also artificial in intelligence uh, is creating some uh, paintings sometimes it is very difficult to uh, distinguish uh, yeah. between so I, i'm of course i'm not telling today or tomorrow mm. but i just feel i just see some at some part at at, at certain point it they will succeed i it's just my it's my belief maybe in 40 years maybe 50 years but i think it's coming uh, sadly, I won't be around in 50. I, I'm unlikely to be around in 50 years time. I hope. <laughs> we are going to continue this but, uh, yeah. maybe in 50 years. Indeed. We'll see. We'll see. Thank you for your question. Thank you for the question, uh, Urash teacher. Uh, and uh, yeah. with your question, actually, uh, something come to my mind that uh, when we are talking about uh, artific artificial intelligence, we are for forgetting one thing, that actually also the artificial intelligence is created by a man, you know? And yeah. so, yeah. so we can also look uh, from the other way, actually. Uh, and it is actually uh, approaching to men. So we can actually expect some uh, of kind of things that uh, then the machine will actually uh, will be able to feel like a man because it's actually created by man. It's not like different from you know. But it's exceeding now. Ah. In today, it's exceeding our, our capabilities. It has already exceeded. I see. I, I, I mean, if, if, I could, if I could chip in here, I think at the moment we work with um, we, we could just say enlightenment humanist conceptions of what the difference is between man and machine. I think where the, where the new machine learning is moving us at the moment is a blurring of the boundary between these ultimately philosophical concepts of, of man and machine. I mean, I think that it's creating a space between these two things which we are learning um, how to inhabit. So, I mean, I think what's going to happen over the next 40 or 50 years is that is that the, the very words man and machine are going to come to have meant um, actually very different things. There is another question in the chat. Gözde uh, gurun, gurun. Shall I read it? Yeah. Dear thank you very much for this enlightening presentation. Through the presentation, I thought about the concept of tonality. For centuries, people, especially in Europe, have remained unquestionably tied to the decisiveness of tonality, to the hierarchy between notes. Although the equal temperament system is an artificial system, it's been accepted by people as a law. And interestingly, when people hear atonal or microtonal music, they cannot immediately accept it and show resistance. This is a subject I've been thinking about for years. Is tonality a naturally felt phenomenon or is it an empathetic process in which people learn and develop habits? So could the concept of empathy have anything to do with habit building? Great question. I think the answer to your question is yes. Um, I think that we build a lot of habits around co-feeling 
And I think that music is one of the ways in which we build habits around co-feeling. I, I think that's a good way of putting it. I do agree with that. And I think that habits are things that we learn and that we develop and that we learn and develop them socially and collectively. And we do so as groups. So I think that this is a very good way and a very important way of thinking about musical um, emotions. Um, I'm going back to the beginning of your question. I'm less sure that I accept that people um, in, in, in Europe, by which I assume you mean Western Europe, um, remain tied to the decisiveness of tonality. Um, I think for the last 30 years, maybe even 40 years, our popular music and our popular culture has moved away from tonality. It's not just about the movement of, and the hierarchy of notes and chords. Um, it's more it's groove, it's based on groove, it's based on repetition, it's based on riffs and things. So I don't think that we have tonality in any simple sense in our popular music. Our folk music hasn't disappeared and that's not in any simple sense uh, tonal music. And for a, something like 50 or 60 years we've been watching film music which is actually quite atonal um, um, even even in Hollywood since the 1950s. So, and um, I, I, I think tonality is, in, in Western European music, is, is, is a rather fragile kind of thing. So as a habit, I think, from where I sit, my perspective is, is that as a kind of social habit, as a kind of social habit of, of co-feeling, tonality is actually a very weak thing um, in Western European music, um, as it happens. Um, because I don't think that most of the music that Western Europeans have been listening to for most of the last 50 years can simply be described as, tona as, as tonal music, at least in terms of classical enlightenment uh, tonality, the tonality of of Rameau and, and people like that. Um, so that's my perspective. So you, you, the first part of your question contains something I, I think is worth interrogating um, a little. Um, but the last part of your question where you, you want to underline um, the relationship between shared emotions and musical practices and the learning and the developing um, of habits around them is I think 100% correct. Yep. Thank you for your question. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, I prepared one or two. <laughs> if I can. Uh, Evet. Ön zaman öncesinde ben e, hocamız anlatırken biraz notlar aldım. Sen bir kısa özetle Türkçe sormak isteyen arkadaşlarımız için. E, hoca öncelikle e, empatinin politik bir e, etik meselesi ol, olması ile ilgili olarak Barack Obama'nın empati ile ilgili konuşmasını göstererek aslında empatinin e, bir fikir olarak her alanda baskın bir gereksinim oluşundan yani soru işareti olarak bahsetti. Hı hı. E, bir, diğer yandan e, müzikal bir etik olarak empatiyi de e, ele aldı. A, a, empatinin müzik üzerinden simülten olarak paylaşılan bir hissiyat olup olmadığı ile ilgili bir e, söyleme e, söylemden bahsetti. Ya da işte empati müzik üzerinden hissedil, anlaşılabilecek bir şey midir? Ya, ya da pardon müzik empati üzerinden anlaşılabilecek bir şey midir? E, sorusunu aslında benim kafamda da doğurmuş oldu. E, de, an, özellikle de bahsettiğimiz gibi araştıran ve araştırılan arasındaki çatışma çözümlemelerinde de işte müzik ve empati kuran bir etnomüzikoloji anlayışı göçmenler ve mülteciler üzerinden geliştirilen bir söylem olarak işte empatinin her tür empati bir empatik olarak her türlü köple ilgilenip ilgilenmediğiyle ilgili de bir söyleme başvurdu. Daha doğrusu bir çeşit soruşturmaydı yani, o, bu sorgulamaydı. O da bir soru işaretiydi yani. Hmm. 
E, empati ile ilgili problemler nelerdir e, kısmına gelince de e, işte aslında empatinin İngilizceye Almanca bir kelimeden yanlış tercüme ile geçmiş olduğundan bahsetti. E, bir çeşit nasıl desem merhametli bir yapıyı barındıran ve hem bilimsel hem de felsefi olarak titizliği simgelemesi gereken bir kavram olarak e, niyet edilmişti ama ee, bunun hocamız bunun gerçek olmadığını söylüyor. Bir kavramın altında yatan temel itibariyle ya da kavramın soruşturulduğu e, kapsam itibariyle. İşte em, empatinin bir fikir olarak yanılsamaya dayandığını söylüyor. Ee, bir yerde bu ilüzyonun çoktan yıkıldığını söylüyor aslında. Hem de en ta, 18. yüzyılda e, Rousseau'nun işte e, meskur karşılaşması işte e, İsveçli paralı askerlerin söylediği şarkılar Van Zavaş şarkısı. Ee, Rousseau'nun burada onların hissettiği duygulardan ziyade e, mesela birini bir şarkı birini ağlatıyorken diğerini neden ağlatmıyor e, sorusuyla sorgusuyla ilgili e, bu illüzyonun aslında ta o zamanlardan beri e, kendi içinde sallantılı bir çeşit yani tırnak içinde sallantıda olduğunu e, söylüyor, söyledi. E, bir de aslında söz, son olarak da işte sözü edilen titizliği karşılayabilecek ve kullanabile, kullanılabilecek daha iyi bir ifade var mı? Kavramsal olarak belli kelimeler var, sempati gibi ya da işte sentimental dediğimiz işte paylaşılabilecek kadar ifade edilebilen duygusallık durumu gibi. Duygusallık olarak çeviriyorlar ama biraz daha farklı. Bu duygu durumu ile ilgili olarak da Smithian Sentimental Theory olarak açıkladığı işte ara, bur- ara buluculuk, hayal gücü, iletişim veya retorik vurgusunu barındıran bir çeşit duygusallığa yaklaşımı ifade eden bir e, Smith'in ilk adını hatırlayamadım e, bir teorisi bu kendi yani kendi yaklaşımı aslında e, son olarak da Smith'in duygusallık anlayışından çıkarılabilecek sonuçlardan bahsetti bu sonuçlarda e, ben kafama yazmışım herhalde. <gülüyor> Yani sonuç olarak böyle bu kadar. Ona bir de kültürel e, mahrem evet. olgusundan değil mi? Onun bir evet. aslında bir e, toplum içinde bir kontrat oluşturma, bir e, agreement oluşturmak için kullanılması e, ve belli yak- duygular üzerinden de bir yakınlık oluşturulması üzerinde kullanılmasından bahsetti. Evet. E, bu minvalde Türkçe sorular sormak isteyen Hı. varsa hocamız yanıtlayabilir. Harika bir tercüme. Teşekkür ederim. Biz teşekkür ederim. Bu durumda sen İngilizce sor Semih. <gülüyor> <gülüyor> Pekala. Uh, actually in the first uh, when you say that the empathy is a political uh, how can I say virtue uh, I, the, the thought that I can, that came in my, into my mind that it is very it is very evident that it is, it is very clear to see that the demand of empathy about the, about every application uh, from governments or even from the companies through activism or in another mean to say environmentalism or in in this case uh, but when we this this is a thought that I, that came to my mind it is very clear to see it. Mm. And, but when when we come to the uh, musical part, uh, you said it is very limited. This this this approach is very limited to the, to Western art music. What you what you really uh, mm. mean? I I I want to be searching searchingly clear in my mind. Yeah, yeah, this no, um, yeah. So when you look at the. Um, So certainly in in in the United Kingdom um, and to a certain extent in North America, there's a very clear uh, disciplinary field in music studies called the psychology of music, uh, which um, has been looking at the question of empathy um, quite intently over the course of the last, I don't know, 10 years, maybe 20 years. Um, And um, I don't read all of this, but I, I read I read several books um, coming out of this music psychology. Um, and what is very very striking to me is that um, 
that the frame of reference is is Western classical music. And the only steps that are made outside of Western classical music seem to be um, to, to, uh, to, to jazz. Um, so I want to know what's what's going on there. You know, it's not difficult to find out about other kinds of music. We have ethnomusicology. We have um, a very internationalized world of music study at the moment. There's no excuse to be so uh, narrowly focused on the Western uh, traditions. So this puzzles me. Um, I'm, I'm curious about that. It seems to me that a, a certain kind of boundary has been set um, very determinedly um, and, a, and a decision has been made not to step outside of that. One of the reasons I can offer for this is that if we stay within this space, we can all just carry on speaking English and that's, that's no problem because we all think that we know what's meant by the word feeling. We all think we know what's meant by the word emotion. We all think indeed that we know what's meant by the word music, right? It makes certain kinds of things easy and straightforward. It makes a certain kind of inquiry predictable and controllable. Now, the moment that you start talking about outside of Europe, let's just say for the sake of argument that we're going to talk about Turkey and we're going to talk about the world of Makan music, okay? What words are we going to be used to be talking about music? What words are we going to be talking to, to describe um, emotion? What words are we going to be talking to describe feeling? What words are we going to translate? Um, how are we going to translate empathy? How are we going to translate intimacy, et cetera, et cetera. So the moment that one steps outside of Western Europe um, and North America and worlds in which English, French and German are the dominant, as it were, philosophical languages, all of the key terms here start to get complicated. And I think this is the reason that psychologists of music are not interested in talking globally, they're not interested in talking cross-culturally. They're not interested in talking about non-European musical world. That's the best explanation I can give for it. It's quite a critical explanation and a rather negative explanation, but it does seem to me to be the case. Thank you. I, there, there are other questions of mine. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Yes, um, I think it's, it's, it's somehow related uh, with your explanation, uh, explanation also with the uh, Hikmet Hoja's uh, question, this uh, question that I will ask. Uh, what this approach, that, what, what do you think that it is, is, is, it, is it a theoretical problem or, it, uh, or you think it, this should be solved in individuals approach in their mind about theory of ethnomusicology? If so, what to say about the theoretic part yeah. of this, this discourse? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah, um, um, good, good, good question. I mean, I think, because my instincts are to think this way, that that it, that we are capable of thinking about this theoretically, that we are capable of thinking about this at a at a kind of um, theoretical and, and critical level. I do think that it's possible to think about emotion cross culturally, even though this term, emotion, is quite a Eurocentric. Uh, comp uh, is quite a Eurocentric uh, concept. Um, I think that there is a very rich anthropological study of emotion, uh, which I think has been trying to answer this question for 30 or 40 years. Um, I think that there are ways of thinking around the translational field here. I mean, the real problem that we've got here is what is an emotion? What is an emotion? I don't think anybody has got a very good answer to that question. Not the sociologists, not the linguists, not the philosophers. I mean, nobody has got a particularly good answer to this question, what is an emotion? So I think in a sense, this is where the kind of theoretical question needs, uh, where in a, in a way, that's where it needs to start. And I think that once we've got some clear conception about how to answer that question, what is an emotion, which is a very abstract idea in a certain way, I think at that point we're in a position to start trying to attach the word mu music, music to it. So I, I, I think that the question can be approached theoretically. I don't think we need to just say, well, let's just take everything down to small case studies and particular case studies and, and kind of 
um, micro histories um, and look at everything on the small scale, I do think um, it's, it's possible to get to at least understand the question that you're, at least approach the question that you're asking here from um, a theoretical perspective. I think that that theoretical perspective is one that works well when it's rooted in the kinds of things and the kinds of ways that anthropologists and ethnomusicologists go about doing things. I tend not to think that these questions are can be really grasped by um, psychology and cognitive psychology. Mm -hmm. And I'm afraid with respect to the, the, the previous uh, uh, teacher who spoke, I, I'm still not persuaded that neuropsychology is philosophically sophisticated enough, I think, to be approaching these kind of questions. So that's where I position myself on this issue. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, last, uh, lastly, the, the, the, the, it's, it's very subjective. It, it, it will be a very subjective question. Would you, would, can, you, can you suggest uh, Eurocentricism critics about the European uh, writers, you know, the academics? Yeah. Uh, yes, I mean, I mean, a writer who I would recommend uh, people to read, and I don't know whether she's translated into Turkish or not. I would be very interested to know, actually, is Sara Ahmed. Um, yes, I don't know very much about her. It was, um, uh, but but he... okay, go on. Right, her name. Um, so, I mean, th this is somebody who I think has conducted, I think, one of the most um, aggressive critiques, I think, mm -hmm. of emotion and the language of emotion and the, po and the political language of emotion, um, I think, in recent years. I think it's critical all of the way down. Um, I would be very interested to know whether that book was translated in, into Turkish and, and if I would to discover the Turkish translations, I would be reading it very carefully indeed, I think, to see how she's translating a lot of the terms that, we're, that we've been struggling with, uh, with here. Uh, it would be a brave translator that, it, it, uh, that took it on. I should also say, because this is the last question, that when Ashk Cumhuriyeti was, was translated, it was translated by a very impressive guy called Hira Doru. Um, we spent over a year translating that, that book. Um, I think during the course of that year, every day, maybe not every day, maybe once every two days, he had a question for me. And sometimes I would spend an hour or more answering these questions. Um, questions just about, in this sentence, how are we going to translate the word for love? How are we going to translate the word for compassion? How are we going to translate the word for intimacy? And what exactly do you mean by emotion in this sentence? By the way, we suggest Lucien, not Mahrez. <laughs> yes, was, yeah. I, we didn't think about that at the time. I mean, I like that. Uh, I, I, I do like that, indeed. It's, it's yes. That's a good at, the sa at the same time of this uh, conversation, there is a question uh, in the chat. Will you read it or I can read it? Yeah, so, I mean, uh, Mahrem, so we came up with Mahrem, I mean... Uh, the, in Turkish, of course, you know, you have a choice between a kind of an Ottoman word and a kind of... Yes, yes. Think about... And a kind of uh, kind of word. So you always have that choice and you never quite... It's never sure. It's never clear which one um, it should be. I mean, intimacy, the word intimacy has a connection with sex and sexuality. I think that's the important thing. And this word, <laughs> I think, has a connection with sex and sexuality. So I think that that was why, in the end, we, we came back. You know, the idea of something that's being concealed, you know, so thinking of sex and sexuality as a zone of concealment, as well as a zone of disclosure, um, I, I think I makes think You mean closeness, closeness, right? Closeness or know each other or something. Yeah, but it's it's not just a kind of friendly closeness, yes, yes. you know, it's a kind of dangerous closeness. I think you see it is yeah. more appropriate. Yeah. Mm. Just think about it. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe, maybe. Uh, please, may you... Uh, but I do... Yes, mm. go on. Yes, I do just want to shout out a word of respect for my translator who did, a, I think, a... A very difficult. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh,
for my last, uh, may you repeat the Sarah Ahmed, Sarah Ahmed's uh, the, the paper or book you, you said about? Uh, let me see. I'll have to, I was just, let me, let me see, let me see. Mm. Give me two seconds. I'll put up a, um, actually, wait a second, I'll just look on. Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, Well, the best thing to do, um, I think, actually, so if you just look up here, yeah, I can, I can check it also. I just... That was a title that that, that came up. Yes, um, I think that's not the name of the book that I read a few years ago uh, that made quite an impression on me. But um, her ideas all tend to come from rather the same. Uh, place so I feel quite sure actually that the cultural study of emotion is probably a good place to start for those of you who want to who want to start with her work but her work has really kind of launched a debate I would have said in critical theory and cultural studies in the United Kingdom and um, I think for people who are interested in the kinds of things I'm talking about that would be uh, she would be a good author to to read Thank you. Um, Thank you for all answers. Exactly. How much time we have? Uh, do, do we have um, time for more questions? If so, I would uh, maybe choose one of my 1001 questions. <laughs> well, uh, you know, the thing is, the thing about empathy and uh, the feelings, every time it was such a big uh, theme. Uh, throughout the history and we can see in many, uh, for example, one of the first uh, mentions of empathy uh, from the Greek uh, mythology example, when the Achilles killed Hector and then the Hector of uh, the uh, father of Hector come uh, to ask, you know, the story. Uh, can I get the body of my dead son, you know, like this and, and Achilles felt something in him and felt actually empathy. It was maybe one of the first mention uh, of empathy uh, throughout the history. I just want to say, actually, uh, it's, it's something with two ends. I mean, it starts with something and with, uh, it ends with something. I mean, there is like kind of um, uh, input or something that moves us uh, to the action. Like, you know, uh, like, uh, for example, <laughs> uh, in these days, I mean, for example, the, uh, Ram we are in the Ramazan uh, month and uh, many uh, sh television shows, they are calculating something that calls rating, you know, like we have to make people cry, uh, <laughs> we have to, and uh, so actually also it's something that uh, there is like, like uh, Priam wanted the body of his son to get back. So these uh, politics or the owners of the mass media want also something, you know what I mean? They want the nation to cry. So actually there is so many um, kind of, um, how can I explain? Like uh, meta uh, information, uh, it's not just the thing of the feelings, it's something also that is going around them. And uh, the feeling, actually it's so maybe one of the easiest things like in the matter of contagiousness to be affected by. I mean, if someone starts to cry, the other person also, it's uh, just likely to start to cry. If someone starts to laugh, it's also very likely the other person starts to laugh. So, mm -hmm. Uh, but with the music, I think that uh, there is the pureness of music, like the, the, the empathy and the culture intimacy and the, the, 
things they are kind of uh, they are there but they are not in the first uh, plan not in the first movement i i think well i uh, this is supposed to be question for you what you think about like the artist which is by the way artist just uh, pure feelings i think you know the the artist who is doing uh, his art and can be anything with the just brain just merely calculation of uh, just measuring compositions or just doing it like a project. And then there is like someone who really gets the inspiration from God, you know, and makes the pure art. So there's also a difference. So I think uh, if we come to the example with Rousseau, uh, that there is the just the song, pure art, no matter of the influence of the song to anybody. I mean, because also the artist it's, it doesn't think I make the song for uh, sound. He just make it, you know, it comes inspiration and he makes the song. And then there is the other things that they don't end. We can make thousands of, uh, you know, empathy, sympathy, uh, culture, intimacy. And it's just going, uh, you know, political intentions and all these things. But uh, I think we should divide just, uh, it's so easy actually, just let's divide it and uh, it will be much more easy to understand all these things, you know, what do you think? I think we, I think what we are, we, I think we are doing that actually. I think that we are dividing, we are making distinctions, we are making discriminations and, and analysis and interpretation i think requires those the, those those those distinctions i think as we make distinctions and discriminations i think in the process of making distinctions and discriminations i think we're also acknowledging connections okay so to talk about feelings um, as being as it were you know pure feelings on the one hand and political feelings um, on the other I do agree. I, I accept the point of your of your of your comment here, which I think you made very well, which is that um, which, which which is that distinctions and discriminations do need to be made. Um, where that takes me actually is is is is is in the direction of of seeing how things are connected um, and how things are linked, um, and um, I think the uh, most powerful um, ideas of the 20th century, um, particularly regarding um, emotions, um, I think have been to show these linkages, have been to show the linkage between the political and the religious and the personal and the spiritual and all of these various different other things. Um, I mean, you started off by talking about, um, about the, about the politics um, of emotion um, and the, the media politics of emotion and how during Ramazan people are trying to construct their TV shows with a view to um, to um, driving up their ratings and to kind of creating big spaces of shared emotions. Well, I mean, I think that this is quite an interesting illustration of where the political, um, the religious, the personal, the spiritual, the domestic, um, uh, uh, emotions all meet and connect and overlap and and uh, interpenetrate in some kind of quite interesting and significant ways. So to answer your question, um, and by the way, that if that was one of one, 1,001 questions, <laughs> I'd love to hear your other thousand questions because I'm sure that they were all very, uh, they were all uh, be similarly kind of um, profound actually. And I hope we have a chance to talk about them. But I think answer, answering that question, I would say, yes, you know, this is what we do as academics and scholars and as thinking and critical people is that we make distinctions and, and discriminations. But the point of making those distinctions and discriminations is to see the connections. Right. Mm -hmm. And I think that the, the, the, the, the thinking about emotions where we're so driven by such powerful ideas that, about, you know, the purity of emotions lying within. I think it's, it's precisely because of that, that, that seeing these connections and seeing the entanglements of these various different kind of zones of our life in and around these things that we call emotions is so important. 
But your question was very well put, and I, I do accept and understand the point of that question. Awesome. You know, you mentioned the feeling actually is difficult to describe, even for science, and also uh, our teacher Urash uh, Pojade, uh, he says that you know we cannot measure certain things. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't know if you are familiar with the works of George Gurdjieff, the uh, uh, he also traveled lots of in Turkey, in Istanbul, uh, Asia, and Egypt, and then come to Europe and makes this kind of uh, set up his system. And he like says he divides like a man is kind of a composition of three centers. Like there is like feeling, uh, emotional center. Uh, then it's the body that is feeling, and then it's like kind of intellectual se se uh, center, and there is some kind of co corporation uh, between the centers, and uh, he says something very interesting. I was thinking uh, lots of time about that. He comes with the term objective art, you know, because now we are talking about actually subjective, or this is subjective. All these are actually all the world is subject, not just I mean, you know, uh, especially music. And uh, is there possible something like objective arts, like uh, really that would be understood uh, the same way for everyone? Yeah, I, I, I don't think I am qualified to talk about Gurdjieff, although he's a very interesting thinker. But let me just put it this way, and maybe this would be a relatively um, a, a good way of, of summarizing um, an issue that lies at the heart of this discussion. Let's just take a an emotion. Let's just say joy, right? I'm writing about Beethoven at the moment and I'm thinking about the ode to joy. So joy is on my mind as a kind of political emotion uh, here. Joy. Now, when I, you know, my experience of joy might be different to your experience of joy and it might be different to Hikmet Hoxha's experience of joy. We might all be experiencing something different, but if we're speaking English, we are all using this word joy. Now, the emotional experience of this word joy might mean all sorts of different and changing and complex things, but the word joy itself is something that we can look at. We can study what it is linguistically, we can study what it is poetically, we can study what it is syntactically, we can study how the word joy is used and appropriated in political discourse, we can see how it's used in everyday discourse. There is something objective that we can come to know about the word joy. Okay, now how that word joy connects to all sorts of uh, transient states of feeling is of course a much more complicated uh, matter, um, which is all a way of saying, you know, it's, it's, it's not all subjective. There are things that we can know. There are things that we can know objectively, even if we can't know everything objectively. So I think the study of emotion, I think, puts us very much in this kind of space. I think we have to guard against the feeling that it's all about scientifically verifiable objectivity on the one hand, or that it's all about kind of subjective irrationalism on the other. I think that there are huge zones of experience that we can come to, to know about in a very solid, I dare even say scientific kind of a way, um, which um, I think the kind of the debates about objectivity and subjectivity never quite, um, which, which then th those, those debates are, are not always, not always helpful. You Once know, again, you know, my, go on, yes, sorry. Yeah. For example, example, objective art like Sphinx in Egypt, example, mm. you know, yeah. but uh, anyway. By the way, two hours passed and dinner time is coming on London. <laughs> uh, well, that's very kind, and I'm sure dinner time in uh, Ramazan, as uh, iftar has, has, has, has long since passed, so you'll be keen to get to your, your food and your families as well. Thank you very much for listening to me. Thanks for listening. Thank you, in moderators. Uh,
thank you. And thank you very much. Uh, yes. Um, Our uh, great, great like two yeah. Exactly. Two, uh, two hours passed like two minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, really, I and we, I think we all enjoy so much uh, of having you here with us. And um, yes, thank you for uh, to everyone joining. Uh, now I can see our number of participants uh, fall to twenty eight. We start with thirty eight. It means it means maybe we didn't make cry to anyone. <laughs> we didn't <laughs> make cry anyone. <laughs> they don't feel empathy with us. What can we do? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it's their empathy. People have, yes, people have important things to do. But uh, yeah, I do. Once again, I appreciate your uh, interest in my work. You're um, spending the time with me, uh, listening to me in English. And um, hopefully um, before long, this pandemic will, will be passed and we can all meet up in Emirgan. Um, at the, at the yeah. very first Maybe you can promise us for another splendid presentation in Turkey. Uh, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Sozme. Sozme. Sozme. Çok teşekkür ederim. Thank you so much. Eyvallah. Teşekkürler. Sunumunuz için de ayrıca teşekkür ederim. İyi akşamlar herkese. Hoşçakalın. Tüm dinleyicilerimiz. Dinleyicilere de teşekkür ediyoruz. İki saat boyunca dinlediler. Sağ olun. İyi akşamlar dileriz. Cenk Hocam. Cenk Hocam. <gülüyor> i̇yi akşamlar. Thanks Martin. <gülüyor> thanks, thanks. Thanks for listening. Bye. Bye for now. Okay, I'll leave you. Okay. Cheers. Thanks, thanks Hikmet. Take care. Kendine iyi bakın. Bye.